<clears throat> yeah, I am here for the rest of the academic year, um, right upstairs in 347, so feel free to drop by. Um, so I, you know, I, I sort of come into the energy issue from the back door, uh, but not entirely. I, I started out my career as a coal geologist, uh, worked for Atlantic Richfield, um, worked on the Alaska Pipeline, but my true love has always been animals and plants, particularly mammals, okay? So I ended up moving into the biological side of paleontology, uh, that is paleontology, and um, as I've gone through my career, one of the things I've worked on more and more is what causes species to go extinct, and that brought me up to the modern world where extinction rates are just uh, so dramatically high. Um, people are talking about the sixth mass extinction, okay? And the reason they're talking about the sixth mass extinction is because there's only been five other times in the past 550 million years of Earth history, and that's since multicellular life was abundant on Earth, um, that we've had these dramatic extinction events where lots and lots of species go extinct in a geologically short time. And these are the so-called big five here, whoops, excuse me, um, uh, the geologic periods, they took place in the approximate years before present, 443 million years, 359, and so on. And, you know, we can't date things with uh, great precision in, in the geologic past when you're talking about hundreds of millions of years. But um, maximum duration of these events is somewhere on the order of those numbers. Minimum durations are somewhere on the order of those numbers. Um, probably a very rapid event was the dinosaur extinction, which might have taken place in a bad weekend. Um, but nevertheless, even though we can't resolve time precisely, we can resolve it precisely enough to know that this is really, really short compared to the tens, in some cases hundreds of millions of years, when things persisted prior to these big events. And at these big events, um, we lose something between 75 up to over 90% of the known species on Earth. So these are big events. You know, imagine looking out the window tomorrow morning and about 75% of all the species you're familiar with are gone. Okay, that's a mass extinction event. Um, now, sixth mass extinction. People have been talking about this for years. Uh, and we're actively monitoring species. Unfortunately, just a very small percentage of species that there are out there to be monitored just because it's, it's a big task. But basically, um, the way things are, are mapping out with our present understanding is, is uh, shown here on what I like to call an extinctionometer. Okay, so 0% extinction here, 100% extinction over here, Here's the big five mass extinctions, at 75% extinction benchmark. And then here's the various groups of animals and, and uh, representative plants that show you the percentages that have already gone extinct in the last 500 years, and not very many, 1%, uh, or even less than that for most of these groups. So that's really good news, but um, the populations of these species are disappearing so fast that many of them are at very high risk for extinction because there's not many individuals left, uh, comparatively speaking. That's what these black percentages are. So you can see that when you look at the, um, what the International Union for the Conservation of Nature classifies as threatened species, those at risk of extinction, then we're starting to move a little farther than we'd like to see along this uh, extinction scale with, you know, between generally 15, 20 percent, in some cases up to almost 60 percent of species at threat of extinction. So this um, really is something to worry about. Uh, there's a lot of issues with comparing past with present, um, and 
for, for you students. I, I think this paper was posted for you. But the bottom line on that, if you didn't take time to read it, is this is what we know, OK? The good news is the percentage loss of species today really is nowhere near a mass extinction yet. The bad news is if we kept going at our current extinction rate, we would be there. That is loss of 75% species in possibly as little in th as 300 years, OK? Sounds like a long time off. It's not really, if you're thinking like a geologist. But that, um, those estimates actually assume that the current rates remain constant. Um, and that brings up the big question, how likely is it that current rates are going to remain constant, OK? They could speed up. They could slow down. Um, well, that brings us to energy and what people do to the world, OK? So this is a, a very boiled down version of all the extinction threats uh, that are driving species towards their demise. And at the root of it, of course, is human population growth. We each have our own footprint, greater in developed countries, less in uh, developing countries. The bigger the population, the more habitat loss, the more overexploitation of species, and the more need for energy. Um, current energy, of course, is mostly from fossil fuels. And that's leading to climate disruption that uh, I'm sure everybody in this room knows all about, uh, which has further feedbacks on habitat loss and other extinction pressures. So that's, that's the part of this diagram I want to focus on here today and think about what really are the effects of how we produce our energy. Now, we can't live without energy, OK? No species can live without energy. And if you think about the energy available to support all the species on Earth, what people normally think about is the energy that's coming out of the sky in the form of sunshine and being converted through photosynthesis to usable energy for other organisms. So that's net primary productivity, or NPP. Um, and it turns out that people are using a pretty good share of that. Uh, we're using about a third of all the NPP that is available, OK? And that's kind of a fixed amount, because it's, it's, um, it's limited by primary producers converting uh, solar energy into chemical energy. So that's, that's a fixed amount, and it's been more or less fixed for really hundreds of millions of years. All right, up until we came on the scene, that was available for species to power themselves, um, all of the species in the world. Now we take about a third of it for our own use. Um, that has consequences for other species, OK? And here are the consequences. You can do a little calculation where you say, OK, on average, each organism ha you know, requires X amount of energy. And there are an estimate of so many organisms in the world and so much energy to go around. And what this um, graph does, it's by a guy named Brian Maurer. It was done uh, back in the late 90s is take the estimates of, of net primary productivity that were known at that time. And let's say that uh, 1996 was the starting point. And then he calculated the proportion of NPP that would be available for other species as the human population began to grow and continued to grow using more and more of the NPP. So as you go, I, I point, oh, this is back. OK, good. Yeah, so as you go in this direction uh, on the graph, what you're really saying is growing human population, um, co-opting more and more of net primary productivity. So these lines are, are what's left for other species. And the proportion 
of other species that could be left on Earth. And you see, if you, we just kept going at the rate we're going, um, from six billion people, it's a pretty gradual uh, decline until you get to about 15 billion, and then, bam, everything crashes, all right? So there's this zero-sum game, uh, and given that there are credible estimates that there would be 15 billion people on Earth by the year 2100, and I'll show you those in a bit, um, that would mean some bad things. However, that ignores a very crucial fact. We also add energy. And when I say we, I actually um, sort of mean the family we. Uh, this very happy looking gentleman, third guy from the right there, is, is my grandfather. So as a coal miner for 40 years. And we, we actually take fossil net primary productivity out of the ground and put it back into the global energy budget. Um, coal, oil, uh, natural gas. So the total global energy budget is actually NPP plus what we produce. And that's an important thing that we often forget about as biologists. Here's why it's important. Um, we produce a lot of energy, okay? Uh, so you, you have probably seen this graph in some form or fashion before. Um, it's just showing in exajoules how much energy that we actually do produce going from 1830 to the year 2010. And basically, everything below the green is fossil fuels, okay? Um, now, notice we produced in 2010 550 exajoules. Exajoule is a big number. <laughs> Um, for perspective, the 2011 earthquake in, in Japan that created the tsunami and destroyed uh, the nuclear plants and so on had only 1.41 exajoules of energy. So 550 is a lot. Um, now, it's not really any news that the more people there are, the more energy that we have to produce to keep things ticking, right? And, uh, and what I've done here is superimposed a population growth graph from 1750 on up to 2000 and then dashed off into the future um, onto the energy production graph. And you can see it tracks pretty darn closely, all right? So what you're looking at is, is the human energy footprint uh, and how that's grown through time. And in fact, when you take this back even farther in time, that's where things get really, really interesting uh, in showing us how important it is to produce this extra energy. So now we're going back with the population growth curve um, about 10,000 years here up to the year 2000. And of course, the big uh, spike of growth towards the right there. What we can actually do is come up with proxies for what the energy balance was going back hundreds of thousands of years. And, and the way we can do that um, is to think about energy as available biomass, okay? So we're big animals, right? And biology 101, uh, there's a certain carrying capacity for organisms, you overshoot that, it crashes. Um, so when you think about this net primary productivity, what was being produced before we started producing energy, that's had to be shared amongst all the big bodied animals in the world, that megafauna, body size class. We're talking about things bigger than a sheep, basically, 100 pounds or bigger. Um, so if you do a a body size distribution of a typical mammalian community. This is what it looks like. You've got um, mice down at that end, elephants at that end, and humans plot in right about there. So everything from about here over is considered megafauna. 
And then if you look at the black versus the gray, um, what you're really looking at is the black <coughs> species are the ones that went extinct between 50,000 and 10,000 years ago. So between 50 and 10,000 years ago, we basically chopped off most of that tail of the natural distribution. Um, OK, so what happened, and what does that tell us about energy? Well, you can do a few things here. Um, you can count up species. All right, so 100,000 years ago, we had 350 of these big-bodied species on Earth. As you move towards uh, the right side of that graph there, you see the red line suddenly drops around 10,000 years ago. Bam, it hits a new stable equilibrium at around 180 species, which is what pretty much what we still have on Earth today. Um, now, if you match that up with the lower curve, the blue line, that's models of human population growth through time. And you can see that just when you start going into that steep growth curve uh, is when you get the crash, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. More and more people uh, competing for a limited amount of resources. Something's got to give. Other big body species go extinct. Um, OK, you can take it a step farther and think about it in terms of actual biomass. How much do all the big-bodied animals on Earth weigh? <laughs> okay, And again, these are back-of-the-envelope calculations, so that's why it's on the back of an envelope. Um, <laughs> but you, you, know, you can uh, play with the numbers in different ways, and the absolute values change. But the overall patterns really don't, no matter uh, what equations you use here. So for for Determining human body mass, it's actually pretty straightforward. You know the average weight of a human. We've got uh, population growth models, ground truth by the archaeological record in some cases. Um, so just average body mass by number of individuals that the models calculate through time gives you species biomass going through time. For non-human megafauna, there's an extra step in there. It turns out that average body mass is related to how many animals there are in a given square kilometer. <laughs> Makes sense, right? The bigger the animal, more resources, fewer per kilometer. Um, body mass is also related to average geographic range size. The bigger the animal, the more that species is distributed. Um, so through that you can then come up with an estimate for number of individual animals and then get the species biomass. Okay, so you do that, you know, as I say, there's different equations that you can use for all parts of this, so uh, you can get a range of values. And the general pattern basically looks like this. So human biomass going from 100,000 years ago on up to the present uh, is the blue line. Um, other wild megafauna is the red line. There's the crash, the cross. Now you can put those two together, and that's what we're really interested in, okay, is all the big-bodied animals on Earth, humans plus non-humans, at any one time. And uh, that's what it looks like when you put them together. So you see there's a standard... Um, actually a value here that extends way back here, that's the normal carrying capacity for big-bodied animals on Earth. And then we have the crash as, as human population growth um, started to uh, hit, a, hit a threshold value that, that caused other species to crash. Then you get a buildup. Now, this is mostly human bodies, all right, um, until you get to this point where you're finally at the pre-crash level, and then we overshoot. Um, that's just thinking about wild megafauna and us. If we add our livestock into it, then we overshoot even more. And this is on a log scale. It gets really impressive if you put it on an arithmetic scale. Um, so this is normal. This is where we are today. Most, well, 
the vast majority of this are people and our domestic livestock, okay? Um, now, if you look at this closer, you see something really interesting. When did that overshoot start? Uh, about 300 years ago, which was what? The beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, when we really started to dig that fossil net primary productivity out of the ground. So, so the bottom line here is that what allows us to have seven billion people on Earth today is that we produce the extra energy that we need. Without that, we're screwed, all right? <laughs> Simple as that. Um, now, we've done it with fossil fuels. And I'll sort of concentrate on oil here just to illustrate a couple of points. So there's two things to worry about here. One um, is that we'll run out of those. And particularly with oil, because that's a, a very efficient energy source. And you know, we hear things variously about tipping points and, uh, and uh, peak oil and so on. Actually, a great book by Steve Gorlick, which um, explores that issue in pretty deep detail. And that's where I'm going to get some numbers for you. Basically, we're probably not going to run out of oil. Uh, and fossil fuels in any time soon. There's the resource pyramid, you know, proven <laughs> reserves uh, of, of liquid oil, easy to get, plus what we could get out of oil sands um, and other related sorts of deposits. Oil shale gets a little bit iffy uh, just because it's such a a mess and such a problem to get things out, but you know if the economics were right, it's it's technologically feasible. Um, so we can start with that. We've got somewhere around five point some billion barrels of oil left in the ground that we can get at, and then we can think about all right, how much do we actually use, and how will that change over time? Right now, well, as of 2011, um, the world average for consumption of barrels per person per year was about 4.6 barrels per person per year. Um, now let's say we're gonna get a little bit more efficient uh, almost inevitably and can drop that at least to three to four barrels per, per person per year, which might actually be a trick when you look at those blue bars, which that, what that's showing you is um, some representative countries and what the actual per capita oil use is in those representative countries. So Singapore is close to me. If you live in Singapore, your footprint is about 81 barrels of oil per year, okay? United States and Canada, we're at about 22 barrels per year per person. Um, down at the other end, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Kenya, less than a barrel of oil per person per year. So great disparity throughout the world. And what getting down to three or four barrels per person per year means is that countries on this end of the graph have to come way down as the other ones come up. Otherwise, there's no chance we're gonna drop it below where we are today, and we're probably gonna go up. So, um, but my estimate and projection is gonna assume that we find a way to get to three or four. Uh, the other thing to take into account is it's a per person footprint and population is growing. Um, these are the uh, commonly accepted projections starting at 1950 on the left, carrying out to 2100 on the right. Um, and there's several different lines on there. Uh, probably the reasonable one to look at is the one that is crossed by the yellow band. Uh, that's the medium population growth scenario, which basically brings down countries that aren't already at replacement value per family. That is a little over two, two children per family, brings them down to that level. Um, and you can see it, it ends up at about 10 billion by the year 2100. So we can, let, let's figure that's gonna happen um, just plug that into a spreadsheet. 
We'll assume there's going to be 10 billion people after 2050, gradual growth up to then, uh, that we've got 5.6 trillion barrels of oil recoverable. Uh, we're going to use oil sands and oil shales, um, but I'll show you the difference if we don't use them. Uh, and we're going to average three to four barrels per year. We're not going to think about natural gas and coal right now, but uh, that's out there to be used too. And there's kind of what we end up with. Okay, so if we do drop it down to three barrels per year, we've got easily to get easily recoverable oil that'll carry us out to about 2088. We can dip into oil and oil sands and get us to a little past the year 2100. And then <clears throat> if we get into oil shales, you know, we're uh, 150 or so years into the future. And then you can read the numbers for what it would be on four barrels. Take home message there, and this segues us into extinction, is there's no chance we're going to run out of fossil fuels and even oil in time to uh, deal with the problem that we have in terms of climate change precipitating extinctions. And you know, you think about climate change and you think about all the different environments in the world and all the different species, and you kind of say, how, how could this really have an effect, okay? Um, here's, here's another way to think about it. So on the left there, we've got the IPCC uh, AR4 projections. <clears throat> and, you know, best case it would be the blue line. Uh, the trajectory we're actually on is the red line. We all, we've all seen that how many times. Um, but look at the panel on the right, which sort of matches up to it in scale. So on the panel on the right, we go from 600 million years ago up to the present. And that wavy yellow line uh, is kind of a putting together a bunch of different proxy data that tells you how much temperature has varied over the past 600 million years. And if you match up that uh, by 2100 bar and the little boxes, the very best case, which would be the blue line, the 66% the probability that we'll be at closer to one degree, <clears throat> the likely best, which would be two degrees, likely worst around four degrees, very worst around 6.4 degrees. If we actually accomplish that very worst scenario, which again is a 66% probability <laughs> given the trajectory we're on, that means in 100 years, we're changing climate about three quarters as much as it has changed through the entire 600 million years of multicellular life. So that's relatively a very big change for organisms very fast. Um, and I would maintain that the biodiversity consequences of that are really going to be a lot more than we've been thinking. Um, people are already talking about it's too late for two degrees, OK? This uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper's report. Um, let's just kind of think about what two degrees, four degrees, six degrees change means to species on Earth. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> what I've done here is I've just taken the emissions from all fossil fuels uh, and assumed 2011 uh, emissions, which is what, four point, I can't remember, something um, per person per year, and, and just projected out how much uh, that would raise the parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere as we go into the future, 200 years. Um, blue line is basically, we don't change anything. The red line is what we have to do to reduce emissions to stay at two degrees. Okay, so that comes out to 5.1% per year for the next, well, until 2050. Um, and you can see on the right side how the rise in temperature matches up with that. So, Basically, by the year, if we, if we didn't change anything by the year 2050, we would be uh, between three and four degrees warmer. 2050 isn't that far off. 
2100, uh, we'd be approaching that six degree mark. Um, now you can think about time in a lot of different ways, okay? 2050, well, it's pretty far into the future. 2100, I'll be dead. Um, but you can think about it in ways that are meaningful, too. So 2050 is about the time that the kids that are out there playing in grade school today are grown up. It's not very far. Uh, even 2100, you know, that's less than one human lifetime, uh, if you're lucky, and, you know, make it past 85. Um, so that's not so far. You know, my training's in geology, <laughs> and I tend to think in geologic time. So I like to look backwards and say, when was the Earth last three degrees warmer than it is today? Three to four degrees warmer. 14 million years ago. When was it last six degrees warmer than it is today? About 38 million years ago. And then you can take it one step farther and say, well, how much change from a biological perspective can we really expect? Uh, and there's how much you can expect. So the bottom picture is the Wind River Basin of Wyoming today, okay? 38 million years ago, 40 million years ago, that was a tropical forest. 14 million years ago, it was this deciduous woodland. Now, now you can't just say, oh, that's what it's gonna look like because think, you know, there's differences in the continental plates and so on. But the point is, there's a lot of biological change that goes on if you crank up Earth's temperature three to six degrees. And species have got to respond to that if they're gonna make it. Um, and the way, they don't have a lot of choices for how to respond, okay? They can move, or they can evolve. That's how they stay alive, that's how they survive. If they can't do that, they go extinct. You know, it's not, it's not rocket science, really. Um, moving, it, is not gonna happen for a lot of species. And here's why, 40%, actually 43% of Earth's lands have been wholesale altered by humans. Look like some form of that big picture there. The lower inset uh, shows you all the agricultural lands in the world, and that accounts for about 38%, 39%, something like that. Uh, the different colors on that just shows you the intensity of agricultural use. So it ranges from um, croplands, you know, monoculture crops on the right, uh, sorry, on the uh, red scale, down to pasture lands that are much less impacted um, in the blues. But the point being, um, that makes it hard for a species to migrate to. Uh, stay within its climate space. And then where we haven't wholesale altered it, this is one of my favorite pictures um, to illustrate this point. Um, the green, all that network, are roads. So there's virtually no place save right in here and right in here where you're not within a few kilometers of a road. So again, think about a species migrating. It's a very, very cut up landscape to try to get from point A to point B. Um, those are, are, the white are airline routes, so we're in effect cutting up the sky, and the blue are marine shipping routes, so we're uh, cutting up the ocean as well, as far as other species. But, so, so moving is a problem. This is one of the big issues uh, with, with species response to climate change. Okay, evolution. We actually are seeing some species begin to respond to the climate change that's taken place over the last six or seven decades. Um, for example, the squirrels up there on the left are red squirrels. Um, they live in the Yukon and they've been moving their breeding season closer and closer, uh, well, pushing it up in the spring. Um, and that, 
people have done analyses there that show part of it is a behavioral response, part of it is actually a genetic uh, modification that, that promotes that behavioral response. Same thing with the salmon. Uh, they have been moving up their migration in certain parts of the world by uh, several days per year. And then we see genetic changes in uh, various flies, mosquitoes, and so on. Now, the thing to remember about evolution is there's two kinds of evolution, all right? There's evolution that is just playing with existing genetic variation, and that's the top diagram. So at time one, you have very wide uh, distribution there of genetic variation, and you put a selective force on it, and you cut off the left-hand tail, so um, now the mean has shifted to time two, and so on across. So you can see that what you're doing with that sort of evolution is working with existing genetic variation and just getting rid of variation. Once you get to here, you're out of variation and the species is gone, okay? Um, the other kind of evolution that really keeps you going for the long term has to do with accumulating new mutations to the genome. And it turns out that the only way you can accumulate the number of mutations fast enough to keep up with the strength of the selective pressure that climate change is putting on species is to have prodigious numbers of offspring and very, very short generation times. Um, so the bottom line on that is the kind of species that are going to stay with it for the long term and that climate change probably isn't going to uh, bother too much are the flies, mosquitoes, rats, mice, those kinds of things. The sorts of species that have longer generation times, smaller population size, are the ones that are most affected. Um, how much time do I have left? Okay, good. That's, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so then that doesn't happen, extinction, okay? Uh, and there's actually several different mechanisms by which extinction can uh, be precipitated. There can be physiological reasons, developmental reasons, species interactions, and then uh, things I'm calling wild cards there. I'll give you just an example of each of those, but but the point being is these are very real phenomena that are climate related. So let's think about physiology first. Um, cute little pikas, all right? You've maybe heard of these guys. They live high in the mountains. The reason they live high in the mountains is because if you expose them to temperatures above 78 degrees Fahrenheit, they're dead in a few minutes, okay? They're just not very efficient at losing heat. Um, as a result, they live on high mountaintops. As those high mountaintops warm up, uh, they move up slope until they're out of mountain, and then they're gone. And those red dots on there that are not on orange shading are mountaintops where pikas have already disappeared, okay? Uh, most of them, since uh, about 9,000 years ago, um, but we could put another series of dots on there that show where they've disappeared in the last 50 years. And there would be just about, well, not quite as many of them, but about half as many of them. Um, it's not just pikas. <laughs> you know, we're mammals too, and we have physiological limits. And, um, you know, here's, here's a paper. Uh, you, can, you can take it or leave it, uh, but... The bottom line on it was that with a seven degree increase in temperature, mean global temperature, which is not all that unreasonable given um, IPCC projections of business as usual, um, we would see, and you can read the quote, small zones where it basically was impossible for people to be outside for any length of time. And it's probably a little lower than that because that seven degrees is based on somebody wearing no clothes, standing motionless, zero activity in the shade, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so you can probably drop that number a little bit. But if, you know, if it got much higher than that, 
there would be huge parts of Earth that were totally uninhabitable outside, uh, we can go for air conditioning, which then exacerbates the problem even more if we stay on fossil fuels. Other species don't have that luxury. Um, the other big thing to worry about, ocean acidification, which is a byproduct of putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, going from 1989 to the year 2009 in uh, a part of the Pacific off Hawaii, what you're looking at is a plot of what the pH values are, the ocean acidity, lower pH is more acid, so the line has dropped, uh, and this is you know, in response to increasing levels of CO2. Um, now the problem is the combination of acidification and warming water has some pretty severe developmental effects on marine living <laughs> species. We've already seen some of those. Uh, there are oyster farms in the Pacific Northwest that last year began to notice that the larvae would develop normally for a few days and then they would die. And basically what was happening is their, uh, the, the, the water chemistry was wrong. It was, it was too acid and too warm and got to a certain point in development and that was the end. Same thing with, um, the same thing has been experimentally shown with a whole bunch of different marine species now. Just two examples, these inland silverside fish, uh, severe organ damage if you put them, if you try to rear them in waters that have the chemistry predicted for ocean chemistry within the next 50 to 100 years. My personal favorite example are learning disabilities in damselfish. <laughs> um, how do you figure out a learning disability in a fish? Well, it actually was pretty clever. Um, what they found was the fish, the damselfish, ended up not being able to recognize the predators that ate them. So that's not a very good adaptive strategy, all right? Um, so now, let me just drive that point home. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so now, same, uh, same thing. We keep burning fossil fuels. The blue line's what we're doing. The red line is what we ought to be doing. Um, and now on the right, I've plotted uh, the acidity scale, so um, getting more acid in this direction as we go up. And then I'm going to compare it to modeled ocean acidity over the past, uh, what is it, 300 million years. And I didn't have time to turn around the graphs and everything, so Here's what you've got to pay attention to. In this one, we're, we're pres the present here, back 300 million years here, and this one, time's going in this direction, okay? Doesn't really matter, but I don't want to uh, make you totally confused. And then, um, those yellow bands are the corresponding pH values over the past 300 million years here, and um, where we're going in the next hundred. And thing to notice is we're looking at a fluctuation that's as much as half of what's happened over the past 300 million years. Um, those dots are important, uh, that value of 7.9, which um, there's the corresponding value on the long-term record. And notice that corresponds to 250 million years ago, which was um, the end Permian mass extinction, which is now uh, fairly well accepted to have been triggered in a large part by warming of oceans and increasing acidity. <laughs> um, so, so that's cause for concern. Um, then there's a lot of things we just don't know. <laughs> that are causes for concern. We, you know, we don't know uh, how the fact that you're pulling apart communities is going to percolate through entire ecosystems. So for example, you have things like woodpeckers who are timed to arrive in a certain place when flowers bloom, 
uh, so that they have their food source and so the chicks have their food source. If you put that out of sync, that is the woodpeckers migrate, the flowers are already out and have been for a while, that falls apart and, ha and has some potentially deleterious effects. Uh, I say we don't know because we used to think that things like this marmot were kind of, in, it's, it's another little rodent that lives, or big rodent that lives at high elevation environments, were in trouble because of um, a mismatch between amount of snowfall and emergence from hibernation, but actually it's turned out that that, that has, seems to be working out okay for the marmots. So we have a lot to learn about those. We do know in some cases that those species interactions are really critical. So we've all heard about coral bleaching. Um, it's not just that the, cor the, you know, the water gets too hot and the coral dies. What happens is the water gets too hot and an organism that lives within the coral, the zooanthellae, actually die. And there's a symbiotic relation between those two so that when the zooanthellae die, the corals die. Um, and we don't know uh, what other of those kinds of species interactions are out there. And then finally, last example I'll give you, is if you look at climatic models, you know, we tend to think about warming or cooling or whatever. But actually, climate is made up at any given point on Earth is made up of you know temperature, precipitation, uh, length of seasons. Um, the list goes on and on. So it's the combinations of those parameters. What this map actually shows you is not where it's going to get warmer and where it's going to get colder, but where are those combinations of climatic parameters? going to change uh, relatively a lot compared to what a species is used to. That's the reds and yellows. And where is it going to change relatively little? That's the blues. Um, and the bottom line here is that a large percentage of the Earth is going to be covered by these novel climates, or at least this is what the models say, novel climates being combinations of climatic parameters that exist nowhere on Earth today. Uh, and a large proportion of what is out there today is going to be found nowhere on Earth. And this is the A2 and the, the B1 IPCC models and how it maps out. Red is bad, okay? And if you look at where the red is and the yellow, it's in the most highly biodiverse places on Earth the tropics and subtropics remaining rainforests. Um, so, uh, you know, w will that affect those species? Yeah, probably it will. <laughs> um, so here's the bottom line, and then we can, uh, I've got a couple more slides, and then we can talk about this a little bit. But, you know, if we want to keep society ticking at the level it does, we got to produce a lot of energy. And, and there's just, there's no getting around that. So um, you can be, you know, you, you can be an environmentalist all you want, but we have to produce energy somehow. Uh, all right, currently we're doing it with fossil fuels, but that I would maintain is inevitably going to increase extinction rates dramatically. We haven't even figured climate change into assessing risk for the species that we classify as threatened today. Um, so, ergo, uh, shifting away from fossil fuels is probably even more important than you think. And I say shifting away, not cutting back for this reason. <laughs> um, here's, I'm just looking at coal here. Blue line is what coal emissions would put into the atmosphere if we did everything business as usual. Here's where we need to be if we were to reduce by 5.1% per year for the next 50 years. If we replaced every coal plant with natural gas by the year 2030, we'd still only get halfway there. So the point is, I mean, yes, we have to reduce, we have to do these sorts of things, but that's not gonna get us out of the woods. The only way to get out of the woods is to go to carbon neutral, all right? We've got about 50 years, I'd say. Um, and, you know, if, if we do it, if we go this route, uh, I, I think we actually 
can avoid the sixth mass extinction if we go this route, kiss them goodbye. Um, all right, so here, million dollar question, right? Can we do it? Um, I think we can, actually. I have huge faith in humanity when it comes to getting things done if they recognize there's a problem. And just here's some examples, okay? Uh, World War II, in seven years, we ramped up airplane production uh, an order of magnitude. Um, this was just the US. If you look at the world total, it's about 800,000. Uh, took us only 20 years or so to rebuild after World War II. I mean, these are tremendous achievements. Um, <clears throat> think about uh, 30 years ago when you were, you know, making long distance phone calls, um, calling collect. Now we're up to essentially a global brain <laughs> that's connected. Uh, that six billion is a little deceptive. Individual people is probably more like 3.2 billion, but amazing capabilities. Um, 50 years, we dammed 60% of the world's largest rivers. Um, 50 years, we build enough, just the US builds enough highways to circle the globe twice, and we're second to China. Um, so we have tremendous capabilities when we want to get things done. And you know, you can say, oh, we can, we'll never, the world will never get its act together. Well, the world has gotten its act together in, in several cases, you know. Um, and World, ending World War II was no small feat. Green Revolution uh, was a huge deal that required both, was very analogous in that it required innovation, scaling up, and international cooperation. Um, and the same thing with uh, effects on ozone depletion. So, you know, recognizing the need, that's key. And actually, I think we're making progress, but we're not there yet. That has to happen much faster. <laughs> than it is. Uh, once we're there, individual initiative is something people have never been short on. Uh, the technology, it's, you know, sure, we've got to improve things, we've got to scale up, but, but we kind of know how to do it, right? And if there's the right incentives, I think we can do it. And then this cooperation issue, both from local through national and obviously cooperation across the aisle, which we don't seem to have much of these days in international. But I think those examples listed at the top uh, do say it can be done if, if the world puts its mind to it. Um, so that's, you know, that's why I think that energy is so closely tied to um, whether or not we see this coming extinction. Uh, I guess I'll just end by Throwing up the thank you slide, there are, um, it's been great being here this, this academic year. I've learned a lot from people here and uh, hope to keep on doing it for the next couple of months. Thanks very much and I'm very happy to take questions. So you mentioned that based on the MPP, it's like the ability for the planet to sustain the life that it has now, and I'm assuming that's based off of like solar radiation incident on the planet. So if we're already overshooting that, solar doesn't really seem like something that would be a good thing in terms of like if, if we're not able to achieve that, that level of support now with the solar radiation, if we start interfering with that, do we take away that, or is that based on something else? No, no. So, so the limiting factor there actually is not the solar hitting the Earth. Okay. We get enough solar in less than an hour to power the entire global ecosystem for a year. Okay. The, the bottleneck is the net primary producers that can take that solar energy and convert it to chemical energy that they and other organisms can use. Um, so, so that's the bottleneck, is the, the number of primary producers in the biological sense uh, that are, are converting that. Okay, so I guess the problem I'm having is there's, there's kind of a disconnect between the energy required to support and then the energy that kind of we have 
the electricity that we generate, things like that, that there, I don't see how that kind of, that adds into that ability to, to stabilize. Because say we generate electricity, I don't see how that kind of adds into. Well, so what, what do you use that electricity for? I mean, use it to heat your house. Right. Use it to, per, well, you use it to, um, you don't really use electricity, but you use fossil fuels to uh, um, put in your tractor to convert, to, to make fertilizer. Uh, so that's the sort of energy we're adding to the system, and we're using most of it for ourselves. So, so what you have, I mean, maybe a way to think about it is every organism on Earth has an energy footprint, right? I mean, everything <coughs> requires energy to live. Um, and in order to have enough energy to go around, traditionally, before people got into the act, the only energy there was to divide up is what those primary producers were able to convert sunlight into energy that everybody else could use. And that's like 720 some exajoules, something like that. Um, once we got into the act, we took a third of that net primary production, and that allowed us to grow our population sizes up to a few million, and then we're out of energy. Okay, there's just no more to go around. We got around that by really mining fossil energy out of the ground that we could use to do things like increase our food production and you know keep us warm in places where we otherwise freeze to death. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, more questions. Any more, any more questions? Okay. So, uh, Bossy, I have a question. What do you think, or maybe we could talk a little bit about strategies to increase the yield of primary producers? Are there any out there that you think are viable to make better plans? Um, I don't think there are a lot of strategies to increase primary producers. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> So, so, I mean, I, now, now I'm sort of thinking about uh, biofuels from algae and so on. But it's, it's still a little bit of a closed system on the primary production end of it in that, you know, you still have to feed them. You still have to get food from somewhere. So um, it, it sort of comes down to the global food web, if you will, uh, taking all the species and microbes into account. And I don't know, maybe there's a way to do it, but I... I have no idea what that would be. Okay. All right. Any more students? No? Okay. All right. How about over here? Uh, oil consumes quite a certain spike in uh, Singapore. Uh, probably because pretty much everything is imported, and it's a very uh, urban technological place. So you know, lots lots of buildings to heat and. Uh, cool, yeah. <laughs> Heating, probably not heat, yeah, cool. <laughs> to climate control. <laughs> okay, how about here? Okay. And this will be so the I one. think that uh, what the student there, I think the student here had to say is, is confusing because I think everything's great. You're one of the first people to mention acidification, which actually is the most dangerous, most closest problem that we have which we can talk about later, but only plants are only 7% efficient in converting sunlight to food carbohydrates, right? So that, listing that as a net primary producer for the planet ignores, as you said, combustion energy, which comes from oxygen made available by photosynthesis <coughs> from coal, because you can't burn coal if you don't have oxygen, mm -hmm. right? So the point is making Making plants the center of the source of energy for the Earth as an MVP mistakes a whole bunch of other alternatives. 
nuclear power. It has nothing to do with the Earth. No. That, that, yeah, no, that's absolutely Nothing right. to do with life on Earth, nothing yeah. to do with the sun, nothing. Okay, so, so the point is that there are plenty of ways in which we can generate power safely that have nothing to do with interfering with the natural cycle. And, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, no, no, that's... Yeah. And, and the carbon cycle is already trash. I mean, this is something I'm a little disappointed in the cover. The carbon cycle is trashed by a factor of 20 to 30 to 1 each year. And it's been doing that for 150 years, which means we have 500 billion tons of carbon in ocean air that no one knows how to get rid of. And that's where your acidification is coming from. And if, unless, you deal, unless we deal with that promptly, we are really up the creek. Right, and so we've, you know, we've already come down the road probably farther than we ought to, but the point is we better stop <laughs> yeah. because if we keep going down that road, uh, I don't think it's, it's going to be it's, biologically it's very... It's old news because in yeah. 1962, President Kennedy asked for a gutter report on what to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have that. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, all right, well, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.